The first half of the study class on mass conversion will begin in just a few moments. O ye beloved of Baha, this is indeed your day, and this time truly your time. That which is vitally required in this day, and which, like unto a magnet, shall attract divine assistance, is for a large multitude of believers, men or women, old or young, rich or poor, illiterate or lettered, black or white, to arise for the triumph of this cause. Let them all, as one host, arise with love and courage and scatter themselves over the face of the earth. Let them raise the cry of Ya Baha Olabha and rush forth. Well, that, beloved friends, is what mass conversion is all about. Raise the battle cry of Yah Baha'i Alabha and rush forth. Shall we try the battle cry just once together? Hmm? Are you ready? One, two, three. Good. Those words, of course, are from our beloved guardian. Words for victory. There are many more to follow. The first half is on this side of the recording. The second half is continued on the other side. This study class is not designed to tell us how to go about teaching the multitudes or how to do the mass conversion work. Many of you already know far more about that than I. And besides, we have our National Spiritual Assembly and their committees to make certain that we do know how to go about it, exactly how to go about it. These words are to help in every way possible to make certain that everybody wants to participate in the work and will be more encouraged to do so, to stir up action and to help us avoid some of the mistakes and problems that slowed up or halted the work in other parts of the world. That is the purpose of this study class, nothing else. It is designed to arouse in all of us a feeling of wonder and joy at the beauty, the majesty, and the greatness of our cause, and to inspire us with an eagerness to arise and to rush forth and teach, not just a few individuals or one at a time, but counties, provinces, states, and nations opening the doors to the multitudes. Now, my suggestion is that we play Stop Me. You know, it's very difficult to listen to one voice over a long period of time. In fact, it's boring. No one has that excellent an attention span. So whenever you have a question about any one of the quotations or an idea or comment of your own that you'd like to make, stop me. Stop the tape and discuss it. Then begin again. In this way, we can get full participation from everyone and have a much richer and rewarding study class. This is not a monologue, you know. It's your study class. So stop me at any time you wish and discuss the ideas expressed. You are free, of course, to play it to the end if you wish and then consult, but I think it's usually much more fun and helpful to pitch in your own thoughts as we go along. Okay? Well, so much for the mechanics. Now let's get on with it. Remember, stop me at any time. Whenever we talk about mass conversion or bringing in the multitudes, the first and most important thing to remember is this, that we must allow nothing to prevent our doing just that. The Iranian army of Baha'u'llah can't stand debating whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, whether the problems involved must make us wary of letting troops into the faith so quickly. That's not our task, no. Our job is just one, and it's clear. Arise, teach, pioneer, sacrifice, contribute, throw wide the doors. The suffering, bewildered, hungry, thirsting masses of humanity can find spiritual guidance that they long for in this day only from us. Therefore, nothing must stand in the path of our winning this victory. Our consultation should not be on how not to do it, but on how we can do it. Right? Therefore, before we begin talking about teaching the masses... We just better find out how important it really is. I suggest we have some infallible guidance on the subject. Huh? <laughs> Fair enough. Above all, Shoghi Effendi writes, the healing message of Baha'u'llah must, note that, not should, but must, must be vividly, systematically brought to the attention of the masses in their hour of grief, misery, and confusion. End of quotation. Another Reaching the masses with the message at this time is of the greatest importance, the beloved guardian repeated. More initiative should be shown by all the Baha'is. 
End quote. Well, why haven't we? I mean, is this some secret love affair we have with the faith that we want to hide from the west of the rest of the world? Sometimes one would almost think so, wouldn't they? The preeminent task of teaching the faith to the multitudes, and I'm quoting the Guardian again now, Shogi Offender reminded us, not one of the vital tasks, but the preeminent task, he says. Are you with me? And now I'm quoting again. The preeminent task of teaching the faith to the multitudes, who consciously or unconsciously thirst after the healing word of God in this day, a task so dear to the heart of Abdul Baha, at once so sacred, so fundamental, and so urgent, primarily involving and challenging every single individual, the bedrock on which the solidarity and the stability of the multiplying institutions of a rising order must rest, such a task, he concludes, in the course of this year must be accorded priority over every other activity, over any other activity. End of quotation. Is every single individual Baha'i in the country participating in this campaign of reaching the masses? Hmm, are they? Well, if we're not, why aren't we? The beloved guardian said of that year 1957, it must be accorded priority over any other activity. One of the last things he told us. Not mass conversation, but mass conversion, as an American Indian delegate to the Canadian Convention once said. Deeds, not words. It's what Baha'u'llah wants. So isn't it about time that we stop fooling around? We have to arise and bring in the multitudes now and make certain that every village, every town, every city in our country, our province, our state has at least one Baha'i and that that becomes a group and then an assembly and then a community and then all of those disperse and go to other corners of the earth. That a tremendous increase in the number of Baha'is everywhere is rapidly accelerated. The beloved guardian told us, and I'm quoting now, an effort unexampled in its scope and sustained vitality is urgently required so that the moving spirit of its founder may permeate and transform the lives of the countless multitudes that hunger for its teachings. End of quotation. The beloved guardian tells us that it would be utterly impossible to over-exaggerate the significance of the faith or to overrate the influence it has exerted and which it must increasingly exert as its great system unfolds itself amidst the welter of a collapsing civilization. Obviously, those are his words. And on pages 110 through 112 of the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, we hear these marvelous words from the beloved Master. Centuries, nay, ages must pass away, he says, ere the day star of truth shineth again in its midsummer splendor, or appeareth once more in the radiance of its vernal glory. How thankful must we be for having been made in this day the recipients of, of so overwhelming a favor. Would that we had ten thousand lives, that we might lay them down in thanksgiving for so rare a privilege, so high an attainment, so priceless a bounty. The mere contemplation, he adds, of the dispensation inaugurated by the blessed beauty would have sufficed to overwhelm the saints of bygone ages, saints who long to partake for a moment of its great glory. End of quotation. Imagine that, and yet we have it here in the palm of our hands to serve. The holy ones of past ages and centuries, the beloved master continues, have each and all yearned with tearful eyes to live, though for but one moment, in the day of God. Their longings unsatisfied, they have repaired to the great beyond. How great, therefore, is the bounty of the Abha beauty, who, notwithstanding our utter unworthiness, hath through his grace and mercy breathed into us in this divinely illumined century the spirit of life, hath gathered us beneath the standard of the beloved of the world, and chosen to confer upon us a bounty for which the mighty ones of bygone ages have craved in vain. The souls of the well-favored among the concourse on high, Amdul Baha says, the sacred, sacred dwellers of the most exalted paradise, are in this day filled with burning desire to return to this world, that they may render such service as lieth in their power to the threshold of the Abha beauty. End of quotation. 
Those great souls long burn with desire to return to the world and serve. And yet we are silent and don't shout. We are sitting and we don't move. Can you believe it? Really? That we would bicker and quarrel or frustrate the work of our assemblies or not show up to the feasts or the meetings? That we'd be, we'd be half-hearted in our teaching effort? Or that we'd say, I'm going to do something really wonderful for the cause of God, but not right now because business is good now, but maybe later on when things slow up you'll see something. Of course, I can't do it now in summer. Ah, but wait until the winter comes and the holiday season is over. Then you're going to see something. Or, I'm going to make a wonderful contribution, give generously. I may even sell something and give the whole thing. Of course, I can't do it right now because business is not only bad, but the stocks are down and my money's all tied up in property. But just you wait till a little later on, then you're going to really see something wonderful out of me. Sure we will. About the same time as the mushroom cloud covers the sky and we say, my God, what have I done with my life and where has the time gone? The saints, the martyrs, the holy souls and heroes and heroines of old, the master tells us, would give anything to return to this world, to serve Baha'u'llah if only for one moment, to breathe one breath in this day. And look at us. No wonder the beloved guardian in our supreme universal house of justice keeps telling us we don't understand the greatness, the majesty, and the wonder of the cause and the days in which we live and who we are. Appreciate the value of the days in which you live, for they will come to you no more, and you will never have a like opportunity. Well, I think that should set the tone for the rest of the study class. I mean, what are we going to do about it right now, before this gathering breaks up? You tell me. Let's go back once more to Abdul Baha's words. The divine charger is impatient and can tarry no longer. Ours is the duty to rush forward, and ere it is too late, to win the victory. What more can I say? What else can my pen recount? So loud is the call that reverberates from the Abha kingdom that mortal ears are well nigh deafened with its vibrations. The whole creation, methinks, is being disrupted and is bursting asunder through the shattering influence of the divine summons issued from the throne of glory. More than this, I cannot write. End of quotation. Isn't it wonderful to be a Baha'i? I mean, what did we ever do to deserve it? Well, maybe it's what we will do after this gathering. Are we intoxicated with the wine of the love of God? It takes a majority of the peoples of the world who are intoxicated with the wine of the love of God to change society. And our job is to get them in a hurry. But this, what we're doing, is a beginning. It might well be the beginning of mass conversion. A pilgrim's note tells us that when the Blessed Master, Abdul Baha, heard that the entire Burmese village of Kunjangun had entered the faith, he said, it is the beginning of mass conversion. <laughs> All right. Of course, it was over 50 years before thousands of new believers began coming into the faith on a large scale in Southeast Asia. And so some 50 years were lost there. Are we going to let that happen here, now that it started? The next few months may tell us the answer to that question. Is it the beginning of mass conversion? Or is it just another one of our skyrockets that suddenly go up noisy and colorfully, spill their treasures to the night, and then fizzle out? and the sky goes dark again. That's up to us. And right here is where we avoid one of the pitfalls that have hampered and sometimes ended the mass teaching work in the past in certain areas. We have to remember that the expansion work cannot be stopped in order to take care of the consolidation. When hundreds and thousands suddenly enter the faith, panic starts in certain areas. The fear that all of these people coming in so rapidly without deepening and training will cause innumerable problems frightened some of the friends. So it is decided that it would be wiser, perhaps, to slow down the teaching work for a while and concentrate on consolidation and deepening. That is a grave mistake. We must carefully and courageously avoid stopping the teaching work among the masses in order to consolidate our victories, or they will no longer remain victories. If we stop the teaching to deepen the newly enrolled friends, we may find unhappily that the moment has stopped too. It can't be started again as easily as we think. The joy has gone out of it. There we were, knocking on the door to our destiny, and the troops were beginning to assemble in order to enter the cause of God, and we slammed the door shut. Because we either didn't understand, or were fearful, or felt unprepared to face the problems ahead. 
I remember telling the beloved guardian when I was on pilgrimage from Africa, about South Africa, and that if we were able to convey to the friends there the love and spirit generated at his wonderful table, we would have such a flood of new believers that we would be faced with grave problems of consolidation and deepening. He smiled with delight and said, yes, grave problems. He was happy. And the sooner every national uh, community faced such grave problems of how to consolidate the thousands and thousands of new believers, the better it would be and the happier he would feel. These are problems of growth. And as long as we are obedient to the instructions given to us by the beloved guardian and now our universal house of justice under the guidance of our national spiritual assemblies, these problems will turn into triumphs. But the expansion must never be stopped. We must consolidate and deepen as we teach. As the work goes forward, simultaneously, never stopping one or the other, no matter what the cost, no matter what the sacrifice, no matter what the suffering on our part, this is what it means to reach the masses. This is how we redeem a stricken society. It wasn't expected to be easy. It's never easy. Imagine the pilot of a jet plane deciding that his forward movement was too fast, and then instead of carrying on through the clouds, he'd stop all that motion and consolidate his position right where he was in the sky. Well, so much for that. I'm sorry about the dog barking. That's uh, that's Tokoloshi, our dachshund. Uh, that's an African name from Lesotho. It's uh, like a Tilleulenspiegel or or a gremlin or a um, little mischief maker. Anyway, he's anxious to get back to his post, as you can see. <laughs> and for that matter, so are we. And right here again, I'd like to share with you a basic fundamental principle of mass conversion. Let me say, repeat it again. One which we found works in Africa, India, Latin America, the islands, wherever it is used. And if not used, trouble. This is not my idea. It is from Shoghi Effendi and our universal house of justice. And therefore, it's an infallible guidance to us. Ready? It is just this. Mass conversion consists of two parts. Repeat, two parts. Both essential, both harmonious, both simultaneous. Teaching is one of them. Deepening and consolidation is the second. <laughs> All right, I, I know I've already said this. But I'll repeat it again because of its importance. And I'll repeat it in a different way. Because often, no matter how frequently it is repeated, by the beloved guardian, the Universal House of Justice, our National Assembly, somehow we still don't carry out these instructions in the spirit of equality between teaching and deepening consolidation. Teaching, you see, is merely finding the place to dig the well in the soil of the human heart. Deepening is the actual digging down into the teachings so that each soul will draw up through the soil of his own heart that pure water of life, Baha'u'llah's principles and laws and teachings. When they do, we can forget those people. That soul, he or she, will be strong and firm and active and will participate in everything enthusiastically. If we don't do it that way, they won't. Those who are most interested in mass teaching must have the very same enthusiasm for and love for deepening and consolidation. It's imperative that they do. Enthusiasm for it, mind you, not just tolerating it and saying, well, teaching is the only thing, but I suppose later on we can deepen them. Enthusiasm for it. Because without the deepening and consolidation, all that early glory of teaching is meaningless. Those who deepen and consolidate, on the other hand, must have that very same enthusiasm, enthusiasm, for the mass teaching work. Without it, they have nothing to deepen. You know, very often, unfortunately, this second phase, the deepening and the consolidation, that doesn't have the enthusiasm, the enthusiastic support. Sometimes it, it not only doesn't have it from the mass teachers, it doesn't have it from those who want to deepen because they feel the people weren't taught right in the first place, and occasionally we have found it also is not there, this enthusiastic support, even among those who have been newly enrolled. Isn't that a pity? They are caught up in the wave of excitement of the teaching and they want to carry it on. Good, that's splendid. But without the deepening, they'll have no fuel to sustain them in their drive. And soon they'll burn out and become empty, disillusioned, feeling that they were deceived in the beginning. 
and placing the blame on the faith and not on those who gave them only a promise of the bread of life without giving them the actual bread itself. And that comes with the deepening. Those who teach the masses and those who deepen are not in competition. They are partners in this glorious, vital enterprise. We must fan this united spirit into a flame that will set on fire the entire nation, the world. Teaching is the match. Without it, there is no light. Teaching is the match. Deepening is the fuel that will keep that fire burning after the teaching has ignited in the first place. Now, you might just as well make up your mind to it that without both enthusiastically, enthusiastically supporting each other, there can be no true and lasting victory. That's what we found in other parts of the world, and here's your chance from pre preventing those same mistakes happening here. And that is a fact. Enthusiastically supporting each other. Signed, Shoghi Effendi Rabbani, guardian of the Baha'i faith. Signed, Universal House of Justice, supreme body of the Baha'i world, source of all good, freed from all error. Signed, Baha'i National Spiritual Assembly. You will never learn a more important lesson from this study class than this one. No mass conversion campaign can live without both teaching and deepening, working together simultaneously, harmoniously, lovingly, cooperatively, and above all, enthusiastically. Never forget this. Did I hear someone say, stop me? <laughs> I, can, I can understand it. We all must be exhausted. But let's stop anyway. I mean, this is a long study class. It's concentrated. But it's of supreme importance to us at this stage in the growth of the work among the masses. We're not quite halfway through the first half of the study class, so let's take a breather. Say, ten minutes. Hmm? You can talk over what we've shared so far. Do whatever you want. Stretch whatever you like, and then I'll see you in about ten minutes. But don't forget to come back. I mean, the best is yet to come. Of course, uh, unless you're leaving right now for a pioneering post or a gold city on the home front, <laughs> then that's all right. I mean, that's what the study class is all about. Or you may get back late if you've gone out to mail a substantial contribution to the National Fund. That's what the study class is all about, too. Or maybe you just want to walk across the room and say, Alcibiades, I was wrong. Forgive me. Let's work this out together. Or... Anastasia, how silly these differences of opinion between us have been. Let's begin again, as the beloved guardian suggested, in a fresh spirit of forgiveness and love and unity, and set this country on fire. What do you say, Anastasia? Of course, if there is an Alcibiades or an Anastasia present here, then my apologies. I didn't know you could make it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know, once in Europe I used the name Mrs. Shigemetsu because I felt perfectly safe. Unhappily, there was a Mr. Shigemetsu there who was a seeker. He came up later and he asked me what his wife had done. <laughs> I told him that she had chosen a wonderful man for a husband, and it worked out all right, so I don't like to take any chances. All right, I'll see you back here in ten minutes at the launching platform. From where, before this gathering is over, we'll all go zooming out into the field of mass teaching. But now, let's get back to mass conversion. What we do here at this conference can make a tremendous difference. The main thing is for everyone to become firm in the idea, dedicated believers in the idea of mass conversion. Not just say we believe in it, but offer ourselves in dedication to accomplish it, in consecration. And not be put off or become lukewarm because of problems that seem to arise from this sudden rapid spread of the faith. Be confident, be sure, be radiant. The National Spiritual Assembly of Canada, in their editorial in their December Baha'i News, points out that sometimes it's difficult for those, those of us who required considerable time and reading and study before entering the faith, not to view with suspicion and doubt those souls who enter the faith quickly on a wave of spirit. Now, we've got to fight this tendency in ourselves and remove those doubts and suspicions. Baha'u'llah didn't come to the Baha'is. He came to the world. He didn't come to the educated, the, the privileged only. He came to the masses of humanity, all of them, without exception. Throw wide the doors, the beloved guardian told us. Right now, indigenous people, the poor, the underprivileged, and the youth of the world, these seem to be the groups most prepared at the present time to accept mass conversion. 
The editorial in the Canadian Baha'i News mentioned earlier also points out that the majority of all of these groups are relatively free of the sophistication, intellectualism, materialism, and cynicism that are now corrupting a large part of society. Those who are still veiled by that materialism and intellectualism often do need longer, more time for the word of God to penetrate and remove the veils that shut them out from his beauty. People who are relatively free of those veils can recognize the truth quickly. They feel it. They can be taught through the heart in a flash rather than slowly and painfully through the head. Can you hear his His holiness Christ saying, I am the light and the way, I am the son of man, and the Pharisee saying, I wonder what he means by that, and the lowly fisherman saying, Yes, Lord. That's spiritual perception. And it may penetrate not only quicker, but have a far greater effect than that acceptance which comes only after prolonged study and questioning. Of course, this is not to minimize the importance of bringing the educated and the brilliant minds into the faith, too. That's vital. And it's just as wrong to neglect them. But the tendency of the world has been to belittle those who quickly enroll through the heart and to praise those who are considered by the world to be more desirable. Forget it. There is no difference at all between them in the eyes of God, and there should be none in ours. I repeat the Master's words from the tablets of the divine plan. Blessed are the nameless and the traceless poor, for they shall be the leaders of mankind. But the point is we shouldn't undervalue those who in a flash see the light of Baha'u'llah and are prepared to arise and to serve it and to teach in their turn immediately, not later. And don't fear for the spiritual safety of these quickly enrolled souls, thinking that they may become an easy prey to enemies or covenant breakers because they know so little. Far from it. If they are sincere and pure-hearted, their quick perception will also readily recognize falsehood and insincerity and deceit and will become a shield to secure them against just such attacks. But only as long as we who enroll them remember that we have to keep on with the deepening work, immediately build on their knowledge of the faith upon that foundation of love for Baha'u'llah and that enchantment with the cause of God. And deepening is the name of the game. The early believers, both in the East and in the West, I'm quoting our beloved guardian now in a letter to Africa, these believers, he says, quoting, knew practically nothing compared to what the average Baha'i knows about his faith nowadays. Yet they were the ones who shed their blood, the ones who arose and said, I believe, requiring no proof, and often never having read a single word of the teachings. Shoghi Effendi made it unmistakably clear that these words were meant for the whole world and not Africa alone, because he sent a message about such teaching, saying that he could see no reason why such similar victories among the masses could not be achieved in all parts of the world. Now there's another dangerous pitfall we fall into, and we have to be aware of it and carefully avoid it. That's thinking that mass conversion is only for the poor, the indigenous, and the youth. It isn't. It's for all humanity, all without exception. Shoghi Effendi, in his last message to the Baha'i world, called for a rapid increase of new believers in all walks of life. In his own words, our efforts, quoting must be immortalized, (laughs) immortalized, mind you, must be immortalized by an unprecedented increase in the number of avowed, note the word, avowed supporters of the faith in all the continents of the globe, of every race, clime, creed, and color, and from every stratum of society. End of quotation. Together, as lovers of the blessed beauty, we must reach the multitudes, the masses of mankind, all men. And that means just that, all men. Not my idea. You've heard from the beloved guardian on the subject. Now let's hear what our Supreme Universal House of Justice has to say. The Universal House of Justice, in its letter to all national spiritual assemblies, November 1969, urged all of us to seize this present opportunity to reach the countless waiting souls hungry and thirsty for divine guidance. Their words. No effort must be spared, and I'm quoting them again, to ensure that the healing word of God reaches the rich and the poor, the learned and the illiterate, the old and the young, the devout and the atheist, the dweller in the remote hills and islands, the inhabitants of the teeming cities, the suburban businessman, the laborer in the slums, 
the nomadic tribesman, the farmer, the university student, all must be brought consciously within the teaching plan of the Baha'i community. End of quotation. That's mass conversion. Every Baha'i, and these words are not mine, they're from the Universal House of Justice, every Baha'i, however humble or inarticulate, must become intent on fulfilling his role as a bearer of the divine message. Indeed, how can a true believer remain silent while all around us men cry out in anguish for truth, love, and unity to descend upon this world? Quotation ends. No wonder the Master said, Why are ye silent? Shout! Why are ye sitting? Move! Remember also that sometimes the practical problems of mass conversion are lost sight of in the excitement and joy of these sudden, unexpected victories. An entire community can be so caught up in this happy fever of mass teaching before realizing that the great majority of its effort, occasionally almost all of its effort, and on occasion all of it, and its resources are being spent in this one area alone, reaching the masses in the underprivileged areas where they are receptive. And of course, that's a good thing. But unhappily, sometimes the other areas are neglected or forgotten for the time being, and the work there comes to a screeching halt. And the needed resources from these areas of substance are unnecessarily lost to the funds. And then we're in real trouble. In their letter to all National Spiritual Assemblies, July 13, 1964, entitled, Teaching the Masses, the Universal House of Justice instructs us as follows. When teaching the masses, the prime motive should always be the response of man to God's message and the recognition of his messenger. Those who declare themselves as Baha'is should be enchanted with the beauty of the teachings and touched by the love of Baha'u'llah. The declarants need not know all the proofs, history, laws, and principles of the faith, but in the process of declaring themselves, they must, in addition to catching the spark of the faith, become basically informed about the central figures of the faith, as well as the existence of laws they must follow and an administration they must obey. End of quotation. Now, sometimes in our mass teaching, we forget about that, don't we? After declaration, the Universal House of Justice continues, the new believers must not be left to their own devices. Through correspondence and dispatch of visitors, through conferences and teaching courses, these friends must be patiently strengthened and lovingly helped to develop into full Baha'i maturity. End of quotation. Now, of course, we don't want head nodders in the faith. I mean, do you believe? Yes, all right, you're a Baha'i. I mean, they're not really. Not unless they've heard the name of Baha'u'llah, accepted him as the promised redeemer of men, and love him in the faith, and have caught that wonderful spark of the faith and become enchanted by it. I didn't say that. The Universal House of Justice said that. The beloved guardian said that, and that's an important distinction. That's the quality that, that we can build on. I mean, these instructions are also clear. It's astonishing that we shouldn't know exactly how to do all this. And if we do know, I mean that we could still ignore the advice given on the subject, since it's unfailing, infallible, and our only safeguard and protection. You know, you can laugh at what I said there about head nodders if you want. But I feel that it's important to share with you some of the experiences that have been gained by the faith in mass teaching around the world so that we can avoid these pitfalls. I mean, what a pity if we too, now that the mass teaching work is just beginning, should mistakenly forget to follow carefully this infallible guidance we receive on these matters from Shulgi Effendi, the Universal House of Justice, and repeated to us by our National Spiritual Assemblies. That's tragic. And it happens. We've found in certain areas around the world that sometimes the teachers there, the mass teachers, are so eager to set an impressive record that rather than make certain that the eager new soul actually does know who Baha'u'llah is and loves him, they'll enroll these people on the most vague and general principles in their enthusiasm and love for the, for the faith, mistaken, but for their love for the faith. I mean principles and in, in, in things that hardly anyone would disagree with. For example... You, you love all mankind, don't you? Yes. Well, then you're a Baha'i. I mean, after all, Baha'u'llah's faith teaches the, the oneness of mankind. Do you believe that the world should have peace? Well, certainly. Well, then you're a Baha'i. We've got a wonderful peace program. I mean, don't laugh. Really, it's happened. And the pity is, it's not fair to the seeker. The saddest thing about such teaching is this. The moment we do it that way, if we know 
what our instructions are. If we don't, then of course it's a matter of education. But if the teachers know what we've been told to do, and still they continue this way because they're anxious, you know, to, to get the faith started with numbers, then the, the sad thing about it is that the divine protection goes out of the teaching campaign. If such methods are used, they're contrary to what we've been instructed to do. If we don't know, we must find out. If we know, we have to stop it. Otherwise, the integrity of the faith is compromised. Sooner or later, and mostly sooner, even those seekers will lose faith in us as teachers of the cause of God, and they'll lose faith in the, in the cause itself. And those who are opposed to mass teaching among the believers, and there are some, although there shouldn't be one single person in any country who doesn't want mass teaching, there are some. And these, however few, are encouraged in their belief that it's wrong to have mass teaching because they feel that this is exactly what is happening with mass teaching. People who are not prepared are coming in. Now that attitude is just as wrong. And anyone who having that attitude begins to withdraw from the work or not to be enthusiastic about it and has a lack of support for the proper kind of mass teaching, that's equally wrong, you see. It's tragic. Just as sad and wrong as the very thing they themselves are complaining about. And one is not a bit better than the other. And neither are necessary since we've been told just exactly what to do. You see, you'll find that souls who are enrolled in this manner, contrary to our instructions, will never become active in community life. You'll find the attendance at your feasts will be alarmingly small, although your numbers may be surprisingly large among the new believers. And contributions to something they don't understand will either be minimal or missing entirely. And problems will grow in direct proportion to the lack of obedience we show in our instructions about how to bring in the masses. Those very pure-hearted souls who were wrongly introduced to the faith might have become dawnbreakers of this age, heroes and heroines, if we had really told them what we were instructed to tell them, and how sad to think that what they both lost, and we lost, just because we wanted to be impressive in our numbers. Now, that's probably not happening to you, but it has happened, and so this is put here as a warning. And not to stop the mass teaching work, there is nothing more important. Just don't let it happen here. We've been told how to do it by two infallible sources, that's enough. If disagreements arise between those who teach the masses and those who deepen and consolidate them, remember the things in this study class and immediately arise to redress the wrong and change the method back to those given to us by Shoghi Effendi, the universal house of justice, and so clearly laid out for us by our national spiritual assemblies. Nothing, nothing is more important than reaching the masses now, immediately. Nothing. It is a command of God. The most important lesson we could learn from this study class would be to dedicate our lives, our resources, everything we own to this task of reaching the multitudes. Throw wide the doors and open to them the paradise of Baha'u'llah's teaching and laws, which are the basis for the future world order, the kingdom of God on earth. Don't let anything stop the mass teaching, and don't let anything stop the mass deepening and consolidation of these same believers. Teaching is the blueprint. Deepening and consolidation are the bricks and mortar, and each without the other is meaningless. So we must never permit mankind to be deprived of this one hope the sole remedy for its redemption because of our own misunderstandings, our disputes, our disagreements, or our obstinacy. Beloved friends, let me give you a, a simple example of how our own failure to turn to this source of guidance, this infallible guidance that we have on mass teaching, sometimes can delay us, interrupt us, and unhappily, occasionally put an end to the work of reaching the masses in the disappointment that follows and the lack of unity. This is on such a simple subject as door-to-door -door teaching. I mean, you'd be surprised at the trouble that could cause. And it shouldn't. Some immature communities have become embroiled in lengthy debates on it. Some even divided. And sometimes they're split apart into camps. Some that are for it, some are against it, and so on. You can't imagine the time that is what lost. It's really, it's heartbreaking. I say immature, not because they're not wonderful, devoted souls they are but because they have forgotten the first step to solving such problems. Turn to the writings. What did they say about such things? If there's no answer, turn to the local assembly. If there's no answer from them, then the National Assembly can help. And if they have no answer yet for that problem, the Universal House of Justice will give us divine infallible guidance. And we only have to turn to the Baha'i News, July 1966, 
where those generals of the nine-year plan gave us the guidance so that the battlefronts everywhere would not go suddenly into those frozen winter camps where everything comes to a screeching halt. It's called door-to-door campaigns clarified by the Universal House of Justice. I'm quoting now. The Canadian Baha'i News has published the following article in the March issue following their consultation with the Universal House of Justice. Quote, The National Spiritual Assembly has now had an opportunity to consult with the Universal House of Justice on the subject of door-to-door presentation of the Baha'i faith. In the view of the Universal House of Justice, the principle which should govern our approach to this entire question is summed up in a sentence of Baha'u'llah, The wise are they that speak, not unless they obtain a hearing. They, the Universal House of Justice, point out, therefore, that it is essential that, and I'm quoting now, that no teaching activity should be an encroachment on people's privacy, nor should it force the teachings upon unwilling listeners. End of quotation. Regarding the dis- the letter continues. Regarding the distribution of Baha'i literature from door to door, the Guardian statement, October 20th, 1956, quite clearly prohibits such a practice. He feels that to distribute Baha'i pamphlets from door to door is undignified and might create a bad impression of the faith. No doubt it is the eagerness and devotion of the friends that led them to make this proposal, but he does not think that the best interests of the cause are served by such a method. The end of the quotation from the beloved Guardian. Letter continues. The importance of discretion and honesty is stressed in using the door-to-door teaching approach. Indiscriminate distribution of Baha'i literature must be avoided, and no subterfuge is permissible. Announcement of teaching events fall within the scope of acceptable practice, as do certain committee or assembly planned programs. In 1963, the National Spiritual Assembly provided general guidance in this matter. And now they quote their own letter. While this type of teaching may be undertaken particularly in neighborhoods where there is a concentration of illiterate people who cannot be reached by any other method, the National Assembly wishes to point out that it should be done only at the discretion of the assembly or organized group on its own responsibility and with due consideration for the dignity of the faith. This statement is not to be interpreted as permitting every and any individual to undertake such activities on his own initiative without consultation of the local assembly or group. End of quotation. Well, that's simple enough. If it's not, then stop me. It should be clear 100%. But maybe there's still some shadowy areas for you, but there shouldn't be. Yes, there are some circumstances where door-to-door teaching techniques can be used, but in conformity with the basic principles set down above. And as to special cases and projects mentioned by the National Spiritual Assembly in their letter, the ground rules will be laid down by the National Spiritual Assembly. If you're ever in doubt, don't raise dust clouds and throw up your hands in horror. Ask. The National Assembly is there to make sure that the spirit of the Universal House of Justice and the beloved guardian are maintained. Ask the questions, you'll get the answers. So much for that. The most important point of all is this. Nothing should derail the express train of God on its path, nor should we switch it off into a siding while we settle something which has already been settled for us infallibly. Keeping a happy, good spirit of love and unity, whatever arises, That's our unfailing protection, and that's how we'll be sure to reach the masses. So let's get on with it. I mean, the world is is hovering on the brink of an all-encompassing disaster on the precipice, visionless and unshepherded. No wonder Abdu'l-Bahá said, Why are ye silent? Shout. Why are ye sitting? Move. If ever a community should be blissful, it is we, the Baha'is. We have the answers for all the ills troubling society and troubling ourselves. Did I hear somebody say, Stop me? Okay, perhaps you might have questioned that phrase. It's a big one, that we have the remedy for all the ills of mankind. And maybe you've wondered, as many of the new Baha'is do, if we the Baha'is are relatively few in number in the world and relatively unimpressive in such limited resources, could possibly successfully apply such a remedy? Well, that's a good question, and happily, we have a wonderful answer. All right, who would you like to hear it from? Five sources, all infallible. Take your pick. Listen and never be in doubt again as long as you live. Rise up like a lion and roar. 
You can hear it from the Bob, Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, Shogi Effendi, or the Universal House of Justice. They all told us, infallibly, that we do have the sole certain remedy for all the ills of the world. All. I think perhaps the best would be to hear it from the very author of this divine world order, Baha'u'llah himself, lawgiver of the world, the judge of the nations, the redeemer of men, the organizer of the planet. Listen, page four, introduction to the tablets of the divine plan. Baha'u'llah's words, he is speaking to his followers. Quote, These few can alone transform into purest gold the dross of the world and have been empowered to administer the infallible remedy for all the ills that afflict the children of men. Dedicate the precious days of your lives to the promotion of him who is the ancient and sovereign Lord of all. End of quotation. How is it possible for us to be silent and not shout and to sit and to not move? How? Remember these words of our beloved guardian. Ready? (laughs) <laughs> or shall we have a short prayer for protection? Okay, here we go. Quoting, Therein lies the secret of the success of the cause we love so well. Therein lies the hope, the salvation of mankind. Are we fully conscious of our responsibilities? Do we realize the urgency, the sacredness, the immensity, the glory of our task? I entreat you, dear friends, to continue, nay, to redouble your efforts, to keep your vision clear, your hopes undimmed, your determination unshaken, so that the power of God within us may fill the world with all its glory. End of quotation. End of a wonderful quotation. <laughs> Somehow, you, at the end of that, you expect everybody in the room to stand up and shout, Ya Baha'i Labha, and to ask for a pioneering application blank for at home or overseas anywhere, or to say... Gee, I got three months this summer. Where can I go? What can I can do? What can I do? Or empty their pockets or to figure out how to mortgage their house or to to, to sell their car or do something. After all, the salvation of mankind depends on it. Man, these are days that we're living in, right? Beloved Guardian told us that we couldn't expect people from a background of poverty, lack of education, and persecution, people who were illiterate, to understand about the faith immediately. These are his words to a pilgrim, a member of a national assembly in Africa, in one of the key areas of mass conversion. Lots of good information here for us. Watch them closely, he said, meaning those folks we were teaching in these areas. Watch them closely. Watch their spirits. If the people are strongly attracted, if they are enthusiastic about the faith, accept their declarations. Watch them very carefully. If you see that their motives are pure and that they are strongly attracted to the faith, accept their declarations, even though they know very little about the teachings. This is a most delicate matter, still quoting. You must watch them closely for their reactions to the faith. If they are enthusiastic, eager, and have pure motives, accept them. Don't be too rigid about accepting their declarations. The doors of the faith must be wide open for them to come into it. Some who seemed weak will grow to be strong and will be good teachers. That's the end of the beloved guardian's words. Did you listen carefully? There are some very important key phrases there. Watch them closely. Watch their spirits, if they are strongly attracted, if their motives are pure. Watch them closely, repeated. If they are enthusiastic about the faith, if they are eager and have a pure motive, accept their declarations. But you see, it's important, vital, that they be enthusiastic about the faith and not just enthusiastic about some occasion where they are present. They must know about Baha'u'llah, that no Baha'u'llah is the promised redeemer of men. They must love him. They must be enchanted and enthusiastic about the faith and not merely swept up in the excitement of the moment, the day, the circumstances, without a knowledge really of what it's all about. This is not a subtle distinction. This is plain and clear and important. If these souls meet these qualifications, accept their declarations, throw wide the doors. Wide the doors to such seeking pure-hearted souls. And there are thousands and thousands of that kind. So we need not merely in our enthusiasm try to add to our numbers in the faith. Because our enthusiasm for what sounds like a great victory of many people coming in without this spirit 
this large increase of believers is really false. If those who accept it are not enthusiastic about the faith in Baha'u'llah, but are instead enthusiastic about the people they meet, the songs they sing, or the joy of the hour. Now, wait a minute. Don't misunderstand. That's important that they have that enthusiasm about the people they meet, and the songs they sing, and the joy of the hour. That is wonderful, terrific. That's exactly the right climate and atmosphere to then turn their focus on Baha'u'llah, the blessed beauty, and on the faith, so they can become enthusiastic about him, the glory of God. And their hearts can be touched and they can be enchanted with the faith and catch the spark and not be just enchanted with us. So take that little extra time. It's what the beloved guardian expected. The Universal House of Justice and your National Spiritual Assembly make sure of the victory. And it's not a matter of days, although it could be, but it can be a matter of hours and sometimes only minutes. It depends on the purity and the attraction of the heart. If they can catch the love of Baha'u'llah in a flash, but don't fail to take this essential step, and you'll save a lot of heartaches. Beloved Guardian wrote almost the same words to one of the National Spiritual Assemblies, and these are not pilgrim's notes. He said, quoting, The friends should be very careful not to place hindrances in the way of those who wish to accept the faith. If we make the requirements too rigorous, we will cool off the initial enthusiasm, rebuff the hearts, and cease to expand rapidly. The essential thing is that the candidate for enrollment should believe in his heart in the truth of Baha'u'llah. Note, believe in his heart in the truth of Baha'u'llah. Not merely be raised to a pitch of enthusiasm by an atmosphere which we may create. Believe in his heart in the truth of Baha'u'llah. The beloved guardian continues. That last comment was mine, obviously. Whether he is literate or illiterate, informed of all the teachings or not, is beside the point entirely. When the spark of faith exists, the essential ingredient is there, and gradually everything else can be added unto it. Therefore, Shoghi Effendi pointed out, still quoting, those responsible for accepting new enrollments must just be sure of one thing, that the heart of the applicant has been touched with the spirit of the faith. Everything else can be built on this foundation gradually. End of quotation. Remember, never lose sight of that basic principle. It is a wonderful thing that so many souls are enraptured by the spirit which is generated on these occasions of teaching. It does cause a spiritual springtime in the heart. But let them know that Baha'u'llah is the source of that divine springtime. And that is why they feel so good. And if they are enchanted with us, it is because of what Baha'u'llah has done to us to make us that way. Tell them so. We are only mirrors. Baha'u'llah is the sun shining in the mirror of our hearts. And it is this light and heat of Baha'u'llah that warms them and brings them joy, not us. Once they know and understand that, they are ready. For it will be Baha'u'llah and the faith that they love. We'll talk more about this wonderful subject in the second half of the study class. In the meantime, you may want to discuss the first half in more detail. Or you may want to serve some refreshments or express your, your own views ahead of time about the enrollment and the problems involved in it. It's up to you. Remember, stop me whenever you wish when we begin the second half of this subject so vital and urgent to the fate of humanity. Okay. While you're seeking out those you haven't seen for a long time and shedding a little love around the room, let me leave you with these words to, to think about until we come back with the second half. Quoting, Verily, we behold you from our realm of glory, and shall aid whosoever will arise for the triumph of our cause with the hosts of the concourse on high and a company of our favored angels. End of quotation. Baha'u'llah. And nice, nice friends to have along with you on a trip, right? Quoting, The more agreement, unity, and love prevail among you, the more shall the confirmations of God assist you and the help and aid of the blessed beauty Baha'u'llah support you. End of quotation. Ambul Bahad. Though the course he has traced for you seems at times lost in the threatening shadows with which a stricken humanity is now enveloped, yet the unfailing light he has caused to shine continually upon you is of such brightness that no earthly dusk can ever eclipse its splendor. The force which energizes your mission is limitless in its range 
and incalculable in its potency. Though the enemies which every acceleration in the progress of your mission must raise up be fierce, numerous, and unrelenting, yet the invisible hosts which, if you persevere, must, as promised, rush forth to your aid, will in the end enable you to vanquish their hopes and annihilate their forces. The measure of the goodly reward which every one of you is to reap must depend on the extent to which your daily exertions will have contributed to the expansion of that mission and the hastening of its triumph. And that definitely ends the first half of this study class. That was from the beloved guardian. I prepared myself to discuss living the life. Oh, well. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Well, I'll tell you, it's the most wonderful subject of all. Don't misunderstand. Every one of us feels keenly aware of his own shortcomings when the subject of living the life comes up. As a matter of fact, whenever I'm asked to talk on it, I wish I could appear in a disguise or talk with a foreign accent. Mm -hmm. all, we all have our own weaknesses, you know. I imagine the purpose of this study class is to help change all that. Right, and for the better. Yes. You were invited to a study class on the subject of teaching as related to the significance and importance of living the Baha'i life. The study class is being conducted by Hand of the Cause, William Sears. He is being assisted by Anthony Lease, a member of the Auxiliary Board for the Hands of the Cause in the Western Hemisphere. Now, the study class has been in session for some time, so let's rejoin them. Well, I must say, I've never had so much fun discussing living the life before. So far, anyway. Yes, I see what you mean. Well, Mr. Anthony Lease, as you can see, is with us again tonight, and we've also asked Robert Quigley to help out. Tony has found some very thrilling quotations to help us get into the spirit of our subject. The first one is from Baha'i Administration, page 68, latest edition. Shoghi Effendi writes, But such staunchness of faith, such an unsullied love, such magnificent loyalty, such heroic constancy, such noble courage, however unprecedented and laudable in themselves, cannot alone lead us to the final and complete triumph of such a great cause. Mm -hmm. Not until the dynamic love we cherish for him is sufficiently reflected in its power and purity in all our dealings with our fellow men mm -hmm. can we hope to exalt in the eyes of a self-seeking world the genuineness of of the all-conquering love of God. Mm, isn't that splendid? Mm. Now that was written to America over 40 years ago, too. Imagine that. What else does the beloved guardian say, Bob? Not until we live ourselves the life of a true Baha'i can we hope to demonstrate the creative and transforming potency of the faith we profess. Nothing but the abundance of our actions, nothing but the purity of our lives and the integrity of our characters can in the last resort establish our claim that the Baha'i Spirit is in this day the sole agency that can translate a long-cherished ideal into an enduring achievement. Mm -hmm. Sole yes. agency. Yes. You know, for nearly half a century then, we've known that living the life was the essential ingredient of successful teaching and the only one sure way to complete victory. I'd like to, a few practical hints right now on how to become a better believer. <laughs> yes, yes, well, 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 well other friends, let me say that the purpose of this study class is not to give you practical step-by-step -step methods by which you can become a better Baha'i or to help you lead a Baha'i life. It's designed to share with you the wonderful creative words of Baha'u'llah, the Master, the Guardian, the Bob, so that each individual heart will be inspired to make a supreme effort to become a better believer. Yes. And only in this way can we ever fulfill the hopes of our supreme universal house of justice and win an overwhelming victory for their God-directed nine-year plan. Yes. No other way. It's rather alarming to think that we've had such clear-cut instructions and guidance for over 40 years mm -hmm. and are still falling short, far short, of what we should be achieving. Yes. Well, of course, what the faith has done and what the believers has done have done, this is wonderful, really. But you're right that measured by the potential of what we might have done and what we could now be doing, naturally none of us is satisfied. I think we'd agree on that. Yes, yes. When we have a partial understanding, we have a partial victory. Therefore, it's imperative 
that we have the fullest understanding possible, as quickly as possible, about the extreme importance, the absolute urgency of living the life both in our individual lives and in our collective administrative lives. Yes. Therefore, I think the thing to do is to turn to Baha'u'llah and hear what he has to say. Don't he? O people of God, Baha'u'llah has written, that which can ensure the victory of him who is the eternal truth, his hosts and helpers on earth, have been set down in the sacred books and scriptures and are as clear and manifest as the sun. These hosts are such righteous deeds, such conduct and character, as are acceptable in his sight. That's clear enough. Whoso ariseth in this day to aid our cause, Baha'u'llah continues, and summoneth to his assistance the hosts of a praiseworthy character and upright conduct, the influence from such an action will most certainly be diffused throughout the whole world. Imagine that, beloved friends. <clears throat> Our individual conduct has an effect throughout the whole earth. It releases a spirit. In yet another place, the blessed beauty, Baha'u'llah says, the betterment of the world can be accomplished through pure and goodly deeds, through commendable and seemly conduct. Yes. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to listen to more content on the Oneness Movement, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment. See you next time.